growing. Many geologists think the show is over, at least in their lifetime. We had the feeling that we had probably seen our last eruption at Mount St. Helens. We knew there was a chance it would erupt again, but none of us were betting on it. As the mountain sleeps, wildlife bounces back. Even in the most unexpected places, in one of the most devastated areas of the mountain, the Pumice Plain, a gopher is seen. It's surviving by eating lupin. Lupins provide the food. Gophers enrich the pumice by burrowing their way through the ash. They mix in fresh soil and help new plants to spread. When you walked around the landscape, it was those islands created by gopher turned soils that were very green and full of flower and seeds. The gophers also play another role in helping wildlife spread. Go, gopher, go! Chrysophuli finds a salamander in a gopher's tunnel. What's interesting about the gopher is they create kilometers of underground tunnel systems. Elk are returning to the area, helping to expand this amazing web of life. When elk move across the landscape, they collapse the tunnels, creating entranceways that salamanders and other amphibians can get access to. Once they get beneath the ground, these are very cool and moist sites that enable them to survive in an otherwise inhospitable area. And the importance of that is allows them to use these underground burrows as stepping stones during hot, dry weather, and eventually to colonize new patches of terrestrial habitat, as well as ponds and lakes. Ribbit. Spirit Lake now teems with amphibians. Fish brought to the lake by fishermen are thriving a clear indication that the water quality is returning to normal. What's happened with the fish was actually remarkable. While we don't have a good handle on the total number of fish, we know from our snorkeling and, and uh, surveys that the population is enormous. Spirit Lake is beginning to resemble a typical mountain lake. Just over a decade after the eruption, life is flooding back to the slopes of Mount St. Helens. The rate of recovery is far faster than anybody had expected. Clearly, our understanding of the ability of these organisms to disperse was greatly underappreciated. We found that a lot of our conventional wisdom was just flat wrong. It was like a blast, a bomb. I can't even tell you what it looked like because all I saw was the ash cloud coming at us. The only thing standing, if it was any tree standing, they were, they were snapped off. So check this place out. I'm standing here in Washington State looking up at Mount St. Helens, a still active volcano that erupted in May of 1980, blasting rocks, trees, and lava miles and miles at the force of an atomic bomb. <laughs> So after all this time, evidence of incredible destruction still exists here. From destroyed vehicles in the mountains to half-buried houses left behind, I'm going to show you what Mount St. Helens looks like now, 37 years later. Check this out. you can hear the mountain rumbling, constant rumbling, grinding, growling sound. Uh... Look at that. 
thousands and thousands of trees ripped from their roots like toothpicks during that enormous eruption. You can see the north side of the volcano, where normally volcanoes erupt upwards. Mount St. Helens erupted outwards, off to the side, and it was like a blast. The force of an atomic bomb ripped those trees from their roots through the air six miles, coming to land in Spirit Lake. Everything was decimated here. This was no man's land. In fact, the blast was so powerful that it totally changed the way the lake looked and everything. It reshaped the land. I'm walking towards the only rod I can see on top of a ridge. Wow. I can hear the mountain behind me rumbling. It's an enormous mud and water started came down and washed out the road. So this is what is known as the A-frame house, the sunken A-frame house. This is basically what happened was this house was in the process of being completed when the eruption happened and a flow of lava and mud came down through the mountains, which is how it got you got four feet of mud in there. So the, the mud came down these mudslides, not really lava because we're pretty far from the mountain still, but it was mudslides that came down and at a rate of 70 miles an hour flowing through and this this mud came five hours after the eruption that's that's the distance that it had to come all the way through the mountains to get here which is incredible you can see the stove down there the refrigerator and if you notice that was all completely covered in mud you could see the mud on the refrigerator probably came up maybe three feet Look at the cabinet tree. So you could see the doorway. Look at that mud line on the doorway. Gives you an idea of how high the mud came up to. Check this out. You can see like, you can see the beds. I don't know if that light's going to do much, but you can kind of see inside. They really don't want you going inside. This is the inside of this. Looks like somebody smashed the door open, unfortunately. So this was a man's house when the eruption happened. A frame. Crazy. Look at all this. Covered in mud. What? Mountain St. Helens. And they attempt to go down these stairs. Mm -hmm. Very old. <clears throat> Took five hours for that mudslide to get to that house. Just a closet. From the time the, the eruption Beautiful. started. All right. Let's see what else is around here. It was most likely a logging truck. But look at the damage. Holy shit. So this is one of the trucks that are left behind right on the side of the road next to a restaurant. You can see the damage from when one of the massive trees up on the mountain, flew through the air, landing and crushing, crushing this truck. It embedded itself Wire in hauser. that truck. Obviously, it's been here for so long that now there's new life, new growth coming out of this. The size of that tree growing through the back of this truck is a testament to how long this has been here. That is a full-size tree. Oh, man.
What are you doing? Come on. What the hell that was? I know I'm getting tired of that shit. It was most likely a logging truck. But look at the damage. So this is one of the trucks that are left behind right on the side of the road next to a restaurant. You can see the damage from when one of the massive trees up on the mountain flew through the air, landing and crushing, crushing this truck. Weyerhauser. Obviously, it's been here for so long that now there's new life, new growth coming out of this. The size of that tree growing through the back of this truck is a testament to how long this has been here. That is a full-size tree. Well, kind of full-size. 30 feet or so. It's been there a while. Man, the destruction is incredible, though. Look at that. Jeez. And, by the way, the entire inside of this is filled with ash. Look at this. Maybe I can... Oh, yeah, it's like a, it's like a dirt and ash together. Man, that's... That is beautiful. Look, it even still has the engine. Man, this thing was one tough truck. This is insane. Look at the size of that rear end gear for all you car guys out there. Look at that, that is so cool. Right on the side of the road. The ash ball came in just minutes. No light at all, you couldn't, if you turned on your flashlight, you had maybe about five inches of light. It just sucked it up because the dust was so thick in the air. Way up on the mountainside. Starting to come across some, some machinery and some 
Oh wow, check this out. Look at this truck. That is awesome. It's a cat. That was a cat. Wow, yeah, that's a full size bulldozer. That is amazing. Buried in the earth here. That's the engine with the turbo on top. And that's where you drive it, drove it. And look at this giant tree that's like stuck or landed on it. I didn't even notice that plow first. Wow. That is incredible. Oh my gosh, this thing is so huge wow check this out this is a huge engine i don't know i, I think this was uh I, I guess this was the engine for the truck look at this giant turbo on the on the on the top of it this is where the driver sat look at that it's filled with ash and soot now, huge, I guess these were fuel tanks that sat above and behind the driver. This giant radiator. I guess it was like, it was a huge boom, like the ca it would pull the cables up, I don't know, pulling logs. It was obviously a logging truck, logging equipment, but really incredible. I have no idea why this is here, or how it Damn. got here. I don't know if it was left that here was it. or if it's thrown <clears> here and <throat> it landed upright. Who knows? These cables are spewing all over, where, all over the place. They're all over the mountainside. I mean, this is incredible. Way up mm -hmm. in the mountain here, just machinery just completely abandoned. It's a natural thing, though. Look at this. Mm -hmm. This is the. This is where you would stand to do the. Uh, do the, uh, the crane controls or the cable controls. Look at this, on, off. They're totally stuck though. Safety chain for something. All the gauges, who knows what these gauges were for. Fuel, pressure, that is amazing. So my guess is this thing has been through a battle or was through a battle in 37 years ago. Amazing how filled up with ash and dirt this is now. All right, I'm not even on the trail anymore. This is way off the trail. I was looking. I was looking over over a mountain ridge, and you could see there was a piece of some sort of machinery or equipment down here. There's no trail that leads to it that I can find, but. Whatever, so I'm trekking through the uh, oh, Washington mountain range way. here up in St. Helens. On me. Seeing if I can no, get I to don't. this. It's totally overgrown, but... I made it to the clearing. Here's the truck. Wow, look at that. Fully intact. Look at that. Look at the whole, the entire interior is filled with ash. Right to the brim. Maybe mudslide. No, oh, that was ash. Wow. Look at this engine. It doesn't even, this, this thing doesn't even look that old. I mean, for back then. Let's see if the uh, radiator still has fluid in it. No, nah, it's bone dry. It's gonna overheat. No license plate. Maybe this was never even really found. I mean, this is really in the middle of nowhere. Just on the side of the mountain. No trail leads to this at all. And look how new these tires are too. 
Uniroyal. My guess is this truck is probably mid mid 70s, which means it was probably five years old, maybe 10 years old when that eruption happened, which really is not that old. Look at the look at the uh, the hoses on the roof; they look brand new. Yeah. I gotta get up on the roof. There you go. Look at this. This tire looks like it was never even used, and look at these hoses sitting here for 37 years in the exact same spot. There's a hatch right here. Let's see if we can open up this hatch. Nope. Probably not many people have seen this because I hiked down an entire ridge all the way. I hiked all the way down that you can't even see how far I hiked up because of the fog. I hiked all the way down here to see this. That is intense. Look at this. This is all ash, which means there's a very good possibility that this thing was pushed down here to some extent. Look at, look at the angle of, this, of the wheel. There's no way someone just parked it like this. This was pushed. I don't know, it's amazing. It's got this tree growing out of it. New life. All right, going back up on the ridge. All right, this is, it's hard to see it because uh, the lens is so fogged up because it's raining so much, but this is a completely flipped over truck. I can't get down there. It's so hard to get down there. It's just dense, dense woods, and it's raining, so I'm not going to climb down there, but this is incredible. An entire truck, like a huge truck like the ones I've been finding, flipped over completely on its back, which confirms that, yes, it was the blast that put these things here. Who knows how far this thing flew through the air. That is unreal. To be able to flip that kind of truck like that, incredible. So it's obvious that this company, this logging company, was decimated by the, uh, by the eruption. And they just left everything. Possibly they left them during the eruption. Feeling, fe feeling the ground shake and Abandoned their vehicles and ran down the hill. Who knows? All right, it's starting to rain as it sometimes does in Washington, so I'm going to hike back down and see what else I can find in the morning. Hiking out was kind of an experience because we walked across, we came across herds of elk that were just standing there in days, and one side of them would be completely burned away, and the other side would just be perfect, just like they were, and nothing happened to them. So this lava tube is not from the Mount St. Helens eruption, but I thought I had to show you this because this is incredible. So we're going down inside, going to do some lava tube, lava, lava tube exploring. So picture this whole cave, this whole lava tube filled with flowing river of lava. That is awesome. Look at this rock, look how cool this is. Look little half circles. Check this out, there's different layers here of lava. And it's, it's cracked. So you can see down in there. That is bizarre. It's like delaminating coming off of the side of the, the tunnel. All right, so I'm about a mile down inside this lava tube and check this out this is incredible these areas where you can see right into the side into the walls of the lava look how beautiful that is yellow and red it goes back inside this makeshift cave and crawl all the way in here <laughs> i'm inside of a, a lava cave <laughs> a mile down in the ground that's not something you do every day. All right, I gotta crawl out of here. Ugh. Oh! All right. 
Look at this lava rock here wedged in between these two shelves that come out. That is awesome. So if you were ever wondering how a lava tube ends, it kind of just ends. It gets smaller and smaller until you can't go any further. And look at this rock. It's like a shiny gray or shiny silver. And it's pretty smooth, I guess. That is amazing. So that's the end. It's just kind of... I can't really... I guess I can go further. It's getting smaller and smaller. It just gets so small that you can't even... You have to like crawl and then it eventually ends. So there's lava. I'm actually walking on lava. So it just... The flow just kind of stopped. And then this lava cooled and... That was the end of it. It's narrow. So this is a massive, massive landslide, a cave in from the roof of this lava tube. So I'm trying to climb over this thing, I'm trying to continue on through this cave, through this tube here, I'm trying to make it over this, over to the other side. But look at the ceiling. This white diamond-like rock glows with a light. Look at that. So check this out. This is a lava waterfall. Lava waterfall? A lava fall. <laughs> so the lava came from up there and flowed down this lava waterfall down and kept on going. That is definitely not something you see every day. God. It's got to be 50 feet tall. Maybe 40 feet tall. Alright, I found the way out. Check it out. You got to climb this ladder to get out. I'm getting out right now. You can feel how warm it is outside. I'm wearing sweatshirt and jeans. Been in a cave for hours. The temperature change is steaming up the camera, so I hope you can see this. I'm climbing up the ladder, getting out of here. All right, I made it out. So basically, it's just an opening. The earth opens up and goes down into the tunnels, into the lava tubes. Can you tell if there's been any change on the top of the mountain? Yes, a good deal of the top of the mountain is gone. What part of it? You're talking about Let's put it this way, I think the crater is probably at least tripled in size. All right, so it's early in the morning and I started my climb, climbing up to the top. I need to see what it looks like on the top of Mount St. Helens, which means you're gonna see what the top looks like on Mount St. Helens. But right now, I'm in this huge boulder field that I'm climbing and it's filled with these giant jagged pieces of lava and rock that were blasted thousands of feet into the sky during the eruption and rained down on this area. So now you get to see what the mountainside looks like climbing up Mount St. Helens. This area is filled with these lava rocks, like I said, these lava rocks are sharp and it's suggested to bring uh, gloves with you. Of course, I didn't bring gloves. So my hands are going to be all cut up when I'm done. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. This is just, the entire mountainside was one gigantic mudslide. So this landslide came down these mudslides filled with glacier, melted glaciers and hot lava rocks came down here destroying everything in its path, filled up these valleys some hundreds of feet deep with mud and tree limbs and whole trees completely changing the landscape. 
All right, coming up to the snow here, high up in the mountain. First time on the snow, it's actually, I guess it's ice, but kind of snow. It's like ice, icy snow, good snowball snow. Now, truth be told, not anybody can just hike this. You need special permits that are obtained ahead of time so I planned ahead when I knew I was coming to Washington and I applied for a hiking permit. So uh, I got lucky I got one and here I am in physical pain. But this is gonna be awesome. All right, so I've traded the giant boulders for this slick, ashy, stone gravel that has no stepping capabilities. It's like ice sometimes when you step on it, you slide down. I think it's gonna be this for another I don't know how long. It's called pumice. This mountain is owning me right now. Look at this gravel, you have to hike in this. Constantly sliding as you grip. I'm almost at the top though, but I'm shot, man. I feel like I've been run over by a freight train. Oh. But I'm gonna get up there. So I'll see you in a second. Well, really, it's an hour for me. All right, everybody. Pretty much at the top. I think just over this ridge is what we've all been waiting for. So I'm gonna look at it the same time you look at it. Oh wow, this is pretty epic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, well that's what it looks like. Wow. Holy crap. So this is first hand, well maybe second hand for you, but first hand for me what the crater of Mount St. Helens looks like. Look at a plane going over. Whoa, it's upside down. Woo! I hope you can see that barrel roll. That was awesome. Now he's doing a dive. That was good timing on my part. Wow. You know, we've all seen the pictures and we've all seen the footage, but seeing this in real life, you have no idea how huge this is. Oh man. So it seems like it's not that big, like it's not that far away, but in reality, we are very far from the center. It is, this crater is huge. It is massively huge. And that lake is six miles away. It's hard to, it's, it's hard to compute. But look at this. That is absolutely insane. And you can hike along this ashy ridge. It's crazy. All around, all along the ridge you can hike. And that's, I don't know how far down that is. It's gotta be maybe a thousand feet down or something like that. Maybe more, I really don't know. So to give you an idea of what it looks like the way I hiked up, you can see all the snow down there and it's just this barren wasteland. It's just this dusty, loose gravel, stone ash. And it's, and it's very, very difficult to climb up, but that's the only way. That's the only way to climb up here, so you have to do it. A lot of people think that the snow up here is actually glaciers, but it's not. Those glaciers are gone. They were instantly melted during the eruption, which created massive, massive mudslides that just flew down the mountain and poured through the valleys and actually filled some of the valleys up with trees, hundreds, thousands of trees and rocks and dirt and mud and lava. 
really incredible. So all in the middle, this whole bulge here came about in like 2003, 2004, it started building up and building up. And now it sits here and it's, there's steam coming out of it from all over the place. I don't know if you can see that. But what's more interesting than that is every once in a while, there's like this creaking and moaning that comes from, I, I don't, I'm assuming underneath the ice. I don't know what it is. My guess is that the volcano is, it's alive. It's an active volcano. So it's constantly shifting and moving. And it's actually pretty intimidating to hear it. Really amazing. So this may give you a better idea of how big this crater is. Look how small I am compared to this. Incredible. So like I was saying, Spirit Lake is down there, and that's where we were in the beginning of this video. During the eruption, the entire lake was changed. It was reformed. It, what it looks like now was not what it looked like the day before the eruption. And world famous Harry Truman, Harry R. Truman, owned a lodge, Spirit Lake Lodge, and when everybody was being evacuated, he refused. And he said, you know, I was born here, I spent my life here, and I'll die here if, if that's what has to be. And they never found his body. Sad story, but an interesting one. So I really hope you guys loved this video. This was pretty incredible making it, uh, driving all around this area and finding these places, getting down into the forest and finding those trucks and the lava tubes. And it, it's, it's amazing around here and beautiful. It's really interesting to see how nature is slowly reclaiming this area. And we'll see what it looks like in another 37 years. Maybe this will erupt again, who knows? So make sure you follow me along on my journey and actually follow me along on Instagram because I'm going to post some interesting pictures from this trip. But um, I'm traveling all over the country, checking out amazing places like here. And I'll see you in my next adventure. Now I got to hike back down. <laughs>
On hand that afternoon is geologist Don Swanson. We quickly packed our bags and jumped on the first flight up to, uh, up to Portland. Despite the eruption, logging companies in the area keep working. The Warehouser Corporation grows and harvests trees for building materials and paper on over 68,000 acres of land on Mount St. Helens. The day after the initial eruption, the company dispatches helicopter pilot Jess Hagerman to fly over the volcano. Right on the very top, the whole top, there was a, a little bitty crater, and there were these big cracks running horizontal around the mountain. USGS scientists install more monitoring equipment at their main observation post, known as Cold Water One. The eruption has been a minor one, but they see it as a precursor of a larger and potentially deadly event. One of them, a 30-year-old volcanologist named David Johnston, voices his fears to a network news crew. It's probably heating up very quickly, and it was probably pretty good evidence that an eruption may be likely. The U.S. Forest Service puts up roadblocks closing the top of the mountain. Forty residents who live nearest the summit are evacuated. Underground tremors make the eruption of Mount St. Helens seem imminent. The governor of Washington declares a state of emergency. Because rapid evacuation might be necessary, tourists and sightseers are urged to stay out of the area. But the warnings have the opposite effect and tourists pour in from around the country. Souvenir vendors hawk t-shirts and bottles of genuine volcanic ash. Some volcano enthusiasts try to get as close to the summit as possible. One of them is Robert Rogers, a 29-year-old radio technician with a passion for mountain climbing. He makes a game out of outwitting the sheriff's department. I would drive up and go, Oh, is it really dangerous up there? Oh, yes, son, it's very dangerous. Oh, do people try to sneak in? Yes, we, we saw a guy up there two mornings ago in a blue sleeping bag. Oh, really? Tell me, what did you do then? And they'd explain what they did to try to catch me. Because I was the guy in the blue sleeping bag. For geologists, however, watching the mountain is no sport. You just didn't have time to do anything but, but eat and sleep and uh, work. Clear weather brings out a record-breaking number of tourists and television crews. News choppers airlift reporters to the summit, ignoring the danger warnings. They are rewarded with 18 small bursts of steam and ash throughout the day. Four weeks after the initial eruption, scientists discover an alarming bulge on the north side of the mountain. Magma, rising within Mount St. Helens, has encountered a blockage in the mouth of the volcano and is being forced out around it. Scientists, like volcano hazard specialist Dan Miller, explain the danger to emergency agencies, but little is done. As the weeks passed and nothing serious happened at Mount St. Helens, it became more and more difficult for us to convince um, the various agencies, both state, federal, and local, that something ugly was about to happen. Over the next two weeks, the bulge on the north side of Mount St. Helens grows larger every day. The mountain was moving at such a rapid rate, about five feet a day or so horizontally, just day after day after day after day. Officials finally heed the scientists' warnings and establish a so-called red zone, a safety perimeter that extends from three to eight miles around the summit. They begin evacuating residents. On the banks of Spirit Lake, less than five miles from the summit, an 84-year-old resident named Harry R. Truman, no relation to Harry S. Truman, tells reporters he has no plans to leave. That's my life. Spirit Lake and Mount St. Helens is my life, folks. I've lived there 50 years. It's a part of me. That mountain and that lake is a part of Truman, and I'm a part of it. Truman's defiance of authority makes him a folk hero overnight. May 1st, 1980. A month has passed since the first eruption. Without another major event, public excitement dies down. But the ominous bulge on the mountain continues to grow. The U.S. Geological Survey sets up a new observation post, Cold Water 2, five miles northeast of the summit. This one is three miles closer to the volcano than the existing site at Cold Water 1. At Cold Water 1, Roe Finley, an assistant editor with National Geographic magazine, is interviewing 27-year-old photographer Reed Blackburn when the ground begins to tremble. 
I looked to Reed without saying anything, but with concern, and he said, earthquake, uh, I think it's about a 4.5. The earthquake is just one of many that occur each day on the volcano, but any one of them could trigger an eruption. Blackburn, on assignment with the Vancouver Columbian newspaper, is ready if the mountain erupts. He is positioned where he can trigger two remote control cameras placed one mile from the summit. A graduate student manning cold water two must leave for the weekend. Geologist Don Swanson and his colleague David Johnston agree to take turns filling in for him. Dave said, okay, I'll do it for, for Saturday night if you can come up on Sunday and, and replace me. May 17th, 1980, 8 a.m. It's been more than a month and a half since the first eruption. Despite the fears of USGS scientists, many of the residents evacuated from the red zone are convinced that the crisis has passed. They gather at the roadblock nearest Spirit Lake. Tempers flare as they try to return to their homes. We're paying taxes and we would, we'd like to use our property. I'm not afraid. Governor Dixie Lee Ray relents and gives them permission to visit their homes today and again on Sunday. Everyone had to sign waivers releasing the county from any blame for what might happen to them while they were inside the red zone checking out their property. The beautiful day brings a number of campers out into the Washington woods. At Jericho Hole on the Toodle River, 25 miles west of Mount St. Helens, high school sweethearts Venus Durgan and Roald Reeton park their car by a favorite fishing spot. There were no other people around us at all, so we just listened to the radio and sat up. Rold has hidden a bottle of champagne deep in their cooler, a surprise treat for Sunday night. Six miles west of the summit, Ty Kearney, a ham radio operator, volunteering to monitor the mountain for the state of Washington, receives a transmission from a fellow volunteer, Jerry Martin of Concrete, Washington. Martin has stationed his radio van at a perfect viewpoint, just seven miles away from the bulging north side of the mountain. Backpacking with his wife, Lou, and their two young daughters, three-month-old Tara and four-year-old Bonnie, Mike Moore passes up two campsites. This was Bonnie's first backpacking trip. We wanted it to be something memorable for her. They find an ideal spot near the Green River, 13 miles north of Mount St. Helens. In Bear Meadows, 14 miles northeast of the summit, amateur photographer Gary Rosenquist and a group of friends set up camp after dark. We made a real big fire because of all the wood that was around there and just had a good time uh, telling stories. It was just a beautiful night. May 18, 1980, Swift Creek, 5.30 a.m. Tree planting crew chief Kathy Anderson informs her crew they will abandon their site near Clearwater Creek and relocate to Swift Creek, six miles south of the summit. I'm still not certain what caused me to have that thought. It was out of the norm for us to, to stop working in one area and go to another when we weren't finished. One member of her crew, Cran Kilpatrick, is surprised by her decision. We were actually going to some place much closer to the mountain than where we were on Saturday and uh, potentially a lot more danger. As the sun rises over Mount St. Helens, Jim Skamanke and a three-man thinning crew begin cutting saplings 13 miles from the summit. 100 miles away at the airport in Yakima, Washington, a Cessna 182 takes off on a reconnaissance flight over the volcano. On board is geologist Dorothy Stoffel. It was my first time to fly in a small plane, and I, I was a little anxious about it, kind of unsettled, and really not knowing what to expect. At the USGS office in Vancouver, 40 miles from Mount St. Helens summit, geologist Don Swanson is waiting for colleagues to arrive. People were going to bring me supplies that I could take up to uh, live from when I, when I was up at Coldwater too. Volcano hazard specialist Dan Miller starts out on the two-hour drive to Coldwater 2. He's bringing supplies and parts for the two time-lapse cameras. I drove over to the battery shed and picked up all of the batteries that I had had on the charger overnight. Nearly eight miles west of the summit, Robert Rogers and his friend Francisco Valenzuela arrive at the Sheep Creek Overlook. They have just finished another illegal climb. They park near ham radio operator Ty Kearney. 
he looks up and says, well, where were you boys this morning? We made up some story of driving around. We didn't want to tell him we'd gone into the red zone. 8.30 a.m. Just above the summit, geologist Dorothy Stoffel is taking photos of the volcano. We were flying directly over the south crater wall, about 500 feet. And as we went over the mountain, I took pictures of Harry Truman's lodge. Lou Moore is making breakfast at her family's Green River campsite. Tara had been brought out of the tent and set next to uh, where Lou was working. Bonnie was wandering around. I was wandering around. I was hanging out down in the uh, room with the seismographs. We dropped John off at his unit and his crew, and they uh, started to plant their trees. I was heading up um, Interstate 5. We made a decision. We'll make one last pass. One mile beneath Mount St. Helens, an earthquake measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale shakes the mountain, setting in motion a terrifying chain reaction. Mount St. Helens erupts with an explosive fury, next on Minute by Minute. And now back to Minute by Minute. May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington, 8.32 a.m. An earthquake measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale rips through the core of Mount St. Helens. We began to see this enormous fracture open up. It was as though you were slicing the mountain in half. The whole north side of the mountain began to shake. Seconds later, like a zipper from east to west, these little brown detonations, poof, 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 zipped right across the top of the mountain. Suddenly, I just looked up, heard some sound, and looked up, and here was this tremendous signal. The ground moved a little bit, and then, oh my God, <laughs> the whole mountain took off. Twenty-five seconds after the earthquake hits, a huge explosion bursts out from the north face of Mount St. Helens. Superheated gas shoots rock and ash more than 12 miles into the air. Dorothy Stoffel's plane is dodging deadly jets of hot gas and ash. Her pilot thinks fast. He's diving the plane to try to gain speed, to outrun the blast, and watching the ground coming up from below and thinking he's going to nose this plane right into the ground. On a ridge less than eight miles from the explosion, Robert Rogers runs to grab his camera. I get back to the car, whip open the door, drop a roll of unexposed film, and start shooting really fast. Click, 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 jam. I got six shots, and my camera jammed. In Bear Meadows, 14 miles to the northeast, amateur photographer Gary Rosenquist grabs his camera and snaps 23 photos in just 30 seconds. I couldn't concentrate on a viewfinder, so I started taking photographs again, and I just kept taking photographs till the, I ran out of film. David Johnston, who is at observation base Coldwater 2, less than six miles from the blast, radios in to the USGS office in Vancouver, Washington. He gets out one short statement, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, before the radio goes dead. All the while, ham radio operator Jerry Martin is broadcasting from a ridge two miles farther north. Martin watches in horror as the USGS observation post at Coldwater 2 is swept up in the enormous slide. Jerry Martin signs off. He is never heard from again. 8.33 a.m. Two more huge blasts of gas and rock shoot out as the northwest side of the mountain crumbles. The eruption covers a 230 square mile area and dumps 200 feet of rubble into Spirit Lake and onto Harry R. Truman, killing him. Above the mountain, Dorothy Stoffel's plane banks south and pulls away from the blast. 
Dorothy looks back to see the top of the mountain torn open by a force 500 times greater than the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. We saw this huge blast cloud lift up. And as it lifted up, there was lightning, tremendous lightning bolts going tens of thousands of feet high. At the Cold Water One camp, eight miles from the summit, photographer Reed Blackburn jumps into his car and guns it, desperately trying to outrun the cloud of ash. It's too late. In seconds, his car is engulfed. Blackburn is suffocated in four feet of scalding ash. The wind is so powerful that it uproots 100-foot trees as far as 19 miles away. Eight miles from the summit, Francisco Valenzuelo and Robert Rogers jump into their vehicles and screech away. Our clothing was like in a gale, just blowing. It was like a, a freight train with 10,000 square wheels just going by. It was the loudest noise I'd ever heard. Six miles south of the summit, near Swift Creek, Cran Kilpatrick's Forest Service crew is running for their lives. Kilpatrick and Kathy Anderson are waiting in their truck at the top of the ridge, ready to lead the evacuation. They can only hope to get their team out before the cloud of burning ash and steam envelops them. You could see these things periodically shoot down the south slope. They were coming straight at us. If we had been a half a mile closer, we would have been torched. What Kilpatrick and his colleagues don't yet realize is that if they had stuck with their original plans to work on the north side of the mountain, they would all be dead. Still, the crew is far from safe. Laden with tools, they are slow to climb the steep slope to their vehicles. Kathy calls on her radio, dump all the equipment, let's get out of here. Minutes later, everyone reaches their trucks and drives to a rendezvous site where they wait for word on the safe evacuation route from a spotter plane. You could just see the debris going overhead and we had lightning around us. USGS geologist Dan Miller is on Interstate 5, 15 miles southwest of the mountain. He's on his way to meet David Johnston at Coldwater 2 when he sees the eruption column. I realized immediately that this was really a huge and very serious eruption. I quickly crossed over the median on Interstate 5 and I went racing back into Vancouver. 13 miles north of the summit, Mike and Lou Moore and their daughters, three-month-old Tara and four-year-old Bonnie, look up to see a tremendous cloud towering over the trees. Mike grabs his camera. The more pictures I took, the more apprehensive I got because the blast was not going up, it was coming toward us, like it was being shot out of a shotgun. The ash, hot enough to burn skin on contact, is surging down the mountain at a rate of up to 300 miles an hour. 11 miles southwest of the summit, Robert Rogers is in his car, following Ty Kearney's van down a winding mountain road. The group is trying to outrun the cloud, but in the ever-thickening haze, Rogers loses sight of the van. Kearney goes on to safety, but Rogers and Valenzuela are stuck in the swirling ash. The second time we passed this gigantic caterpillar tractor in the dark, <laughs> we knew we were lost. High above them, Dorothy Stoffel is in a small airplane, hoping to put some distance between herself and the mountain. We began to see this huge grouping of aircraft rushing towards the mountain and we thought you know just like the media <laughs> you know they're going to get there as fast as they can while we're trying to leave Stoffel lands 40 miles away in portland 13 miles north of the summit the moore family is hit by a shock wave we felt a squeezing of our bodies a very tight squeezing and Lou said that this didn't happen to her, but my ears popped repeatedly. Just pop, 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 pop. 40 miles away in Vancouver, the phone rings in National Geographic editor Roe Finley's hotel room. It was Ralph Perry, one of our contract photographers. He said, Roe, if you'll step out the door of your hotel and look to the northeast, you can see Mount St. Helens filling the sky. home in Kelso, Washington, Ray Pleasant, a helicopter base manager for the Warehouse Corporation, is still in bed when he hears a knock at the door. Our neighbor, she used to monitor the CV or the uh, a scanner, and she found out that the mountain had erupted. Although his logging crews are outside the red zone, Pleasant needs every available chopper in the air for possible rescues. 
he immediately heads out to the nearest base. On a small farm 37 miles from the summit, Jess Hagerman, a captain in the National Guard, is getting ready for church. They called me to, to call and find out how many people we had that were uh, able to fly. Hagerman immediately heads to the Air National Guard base at Fort Lewis, 20 miles away. The vertical column of ash and steam continues to expand upward and outward. 13 miles away at the Green River campsite, ash begins to rain onto the Moore family. They take cover in a dilapidated hunter's shack, but it affords little protection. Mike and Lou Moore's primary concern, keeping their daughters alive. We gave Bonnie a handkerchief that had been wetted down with water from a canteen. Well, I wasn't going to work for Tara. She's three months old. So what we did is we wrapped her up in blankets. At one point, Lou went over and pinched her because she was so quiet, she thought she was dead, and she wanted her to cry <laughs> to prove that she wasn't dead. <laughs> and we were all very relieved to hear that cry. The intense heat from the volcano melts the mountain's ice cap, sending 46 billion gallons of water into the Toodle Valley below. Mudslides, heated to 91 degrees and moving at 90 miles per hour, rush down the mountain. 25 miles from the summit, along the south fork of the Toodle River, high school sweethearts Roald Reeton and Venus Durgan hear the sound of warning sirens. We just pulled the tent right out of the stakes <laughs> and ran up to the car. Roald guns the engine of his Oldsmobile, but it's too late. The engorged Toodle River is now raging toward them, carrying logs and debris from nearby lumber yards. We surrounded the car and picked up the car, and at that point, the first instinct was to get out of the car but there was no place to run. Their car is engulfed by the flood. They jump from the vehicle into the swirling mass. I was lucky enough to land on a large log, and Venus went right in between the one I landed on and another one, and was gone, just instantly gone. It's like, I, I thought she was dead. The couple and hundreds of others on the mountain fight to survive. Next on A and E. And now back to minute by minute. May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington. 9:01 a.m. Mount St. Helens has erupted with the force of 10 megatons of TNT. A cloud of scorching ash mushrooms 15 miles into the air. 25 miles away, along the south fork of the Toodle River, campers Roald Reeton and Venus Durgan have been swept away by a deluge of mud and logs. Venus loses sight of Roald as she is sucked down into the morass. I could hear him screaming in terror. I kept my hands and head above water, and at one point, two logs started pinching my wrist. I thought I was going to lose my arm or my hand. The pain was excruciating, and at that point, I thought it was over. Roald, clinging desperately to a log, sees Venus's hand reaching out between two massive timbers. He lunges for her as the logs close in around her. They were moving up and down and sideways, and it would just like peel the skin off her chin. I felt him pull me up on top of a log, and he just kept screaming to hang on. Finally, after a terrifying mile-long ride, Roald maneuvers Venus across the logs and onto the banks of the river. <clears throat> Venus's wrist is smashed and her right forearm is stripped down to the muscle. She is going into shock and Roald knows that their only chance of survival is to keep moving. They make their way through the thick forest, hoping to find a way out. Walking back through that was, was hell. I heard a number of helicopters overhead, so at that point I wanted to get out of that heavy stand of trees we were at and be found. Nine miles from the summit, tree planters Cran Kilpatrick and Kathy Anderson have been waiting for 30 minutes with a convoy of Forest Service trucks. They're hoping a spotter plane will arrive soon to scout a safe route off the mountain. They are in constant danger of being engulfed by burning ash. As the crew waits, tension builds to the breaking point. There's one guy started to run, and we actually literally had to grab him and throw him back into the van. He got hit. <laughs> Mostly just going to knock some sense back into him. 
Finally, word comes over the radio that the ash is still too thick to allow a spotter plane to fly into their area. They'll have to find their own way out, driving across the bridge of the already swollen Swift Creek. I ran out onto the bridge. What I wanted to do is see if a mud flow was coming down the uh, Swift Creek. There wasn't one coming, so I signaled everybody across the bridge. Ash is raining down heavily as Kilpatrick jumps into the last vehicle on the convoy. Just on the other side of the bridge, his truck stalls. This truck in front of us just disappears into the cloud. We didn't see anybody. It was like, oh my God, we're alone here. Kilpatrick radios Anderson, and she hurries back to pick him up. The convoy slowly makes its way down the mountain to safety. Two miles from the summit, geologist Don Swanson is flying in a Forest Service plane, searching for his colleague, David Johnston. There was not much chance that David or anybody else in the area was, was going to live through it. Heading toward the mountain in a Cessna, Roe Finley hopes to reach photographer Reed Blackburn at Coldwater One. And I'd flown over uh, cities bombed and burning during the war, but this was so much more awesome. The wind shifts, and the ash cloud heads east, a welcome sight to the Moore family, who are hiding out in an old shack 13 miles to the north of the volcano. I decided it was time to go out and, and see what I could see outside. Unfortunately, the door was blocked with six inches of ash, and it took quite a bit of kicking to, to get it open. I could make out the outline of a tree, and that's when I started eating pretty good. Lou Moore carries three-month-old Tara, while Mike Moore gathers up four-year-old Bonnie. He shoulders the backpack containing their tent, food, and survival equipment. On a logging road eight miles from the summit, Robert Rogers and Francisco Valenzuela are lost in the haze of ash. Then, way behind us out on the west, this little pinpoint of light. That little spot of light got bigger and bigger and bigger. As the air slowly clears, Rogers and Valenzuela are able to navigate their way out. The ash cloud reaches Yakima, Washington, 97 miles to the northeast. Though no longer hot, the ash makes it difficult to breathe. So this is, of course, the source of the big problem, the volcanic ash buildup. I'd say the, uh, the buildup now is at least three-quarters of an inch. Residents must shovel off their roofs to keep them from collapsing. A weather satellite captures photos of the ash cloud as it stretches across Washington State and reaches Spokane, 200 miles to the northeast of Mount St. Helens. It has taken nearly three hours for badly injured campers Roald Reeton and Venus Durgan to struggle through the dense forest. I knew we had to go upstream because we floated underneath the bridge. I figured if anybody was going to be anywhere, they'd be there. And um, there was a sheriff's car on that bridge. The sheriff's deputy radios for a helicopter evacuation. Nearly four hours after the first explosion, the eruption is still going strong. Fresh magma was rising up and was escaping from the volcano. Jets of burning gas sweep down the flanks of Mount St. Helens at up to 80 miles an hour. 11 miles from the summit, Mike Moore and his wife Lou try to get their young daughters to safety. Weighed down with survival equipment, Mike comes to an area of blown down trees 6 to 12 feet in diameter. I couldn't carry Bonnie. Lou couldn't carry her because she had Tara in her backpack and Bonnie was basically on her own in between us. She's a pretty tough kid, but for four years old, you're asking an awful lot. The Moors struggle to keep their children alive as rescuers search frantically for stranded victims. Next on Minute by Minute. Now back to Minute by Minute. May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington, 12 p.m. The mountain has now been erupting for three and a half hours, sending a total of 490 tons of ash hurtling over an area nearly the size of West Virginia. Emergency services estimate at least three people are missing and seven are confirmed dead. 
area hospitals filled with injured suffering from ash inhalation and burns. Rescue teams searching for survivors find they can't recognize a single landmark. Where's Spirit Lake? Is that it over there? I can't believe it. The rescue operation is a dangerous one. The crews are getting tired. The machinery needs to be carefully maintained. Chopper pilot Ray Pleasant and his crew respond to an emergency call near the Toodle River. When they arrive, they find Roald Reeton and his badly injured girlfriend, Venus Durgan. The crew jumps out and loads Venus in. Pilot Ray Pleasant pulls back on the controls and heads out of danger. I was able to look back. I just saw this brown body, a tiny little brown body in the back with the big, big eyes looking at me and I'm just scared. A second helicopter airlifts Reeton out. The choppers fly across the river to the town of Tootle, where a medevac unit has been set up at a school. 14 miles from the summit, the ash is so thick it is almost impossible to see the ground. National Guard chopper pilot Jess Hagerman flies his OH-58 back and forth over the terrain searching for Jim Skamanke and his forestry crew. All of a sudden we look down and we see some kind of a car or a, a truck down there. And, and so we swung around. One thing that you could see were footprints in, in the ash. So then you know that you've probably got some survivors. The footprints diverge, indicating the four men split into two parties. Hagerman banks his copter and follows one set until he locates two of the missing men. One of the people would stand up and, and wave his arms and then, you know, he'd kind of fall back down and, and the other fellow never really did get up off the ground. Hagerman's crew chief, Randy Fonts, volunteers to go down after the two men, even though he has no idea what awaits him. This stuff could have been uh, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. We hadn't, didn't have a clue. But, so anyway, he gets out of the helicopter, gets on the skid, and jumps into this stuff. The ash has cooled considerably, but it was scalding when it blasted over the stranded men. One of the foresters, Jim Skamanke, is burned over nearly half his body. His co-worker is sprawled on the ground near him, barely able to breathe. Hagelman lands the helicopter and hurries through eight inches of talcum powder fine ash to help his crew chief evacuate the badly burned men. When you touch their clothes, it was, it was like if you scorch your clothes with an iron and you just pull it like that and it, it just shreds apart. The two men are taken to nearby Longview Hospital where they are treated for second and third degree burns and ash inhalation. An Air National Guard helicopter finds the third member of the crew sitting atop a tree in the middle of a mud flow. He is rushed to the hospital. But the leader of the crew is still missing. Venus Durgan is at Longview Hospital receiving medical attention. Her wounds are filled with ash. The nurses were crying because they had to immerse me in a tub of water and take sponges and scrape out my wounds. And when the doctor came in, he said, you didn't do a good enough job. I, they had to take me back in a second time, and they had to put me on morphine at that point because I was in such pain. Robert Rogers makes it out of the woods and stops on the I-5 freeway to look back at the volcano 25 miles away. Everybody was stopped on the freeway looking at the volcano saying, what can happen? He's covered with ash. And I drove back to Portland, and that was, that was it. Now that the pressure within the volcano is relieved, the eruption gradually begins to subside. 200 square miles of forest have been destroyed. Heavy equipment lays tossed about like toys. Nine and a half hours after the eruption, Venus Durgan's boyfriend, Roald Reedon, is released from Longview Hospital into his parents' care. They find a hotel for the night, and Roald's father tries to scrub more ash from his son's wounds. Oh, it hurts so bad, it's like I, I passed out. I mean, God bless him, you know, he, he, he did a pretty good job, but, you know, he didn't get it all out. So, you know, I'm tattooed in spots on my legs, you know, from where the ash got rubbed into my skin. In her hospital room, Venus Durgan watches coverage of the eruption. I laid in the hospital room that night, watching all the events on TV. My IV bottle in the hospital is shaking every time the mountain erupts. 
but not everyone is out of danger. As night falls on Mount St. Helens, Mike Moore, his wife, and two young daughters have not been able to find their way out of the forest. They pitch camp for the night, but Mike cannot sleep. We could hear the volcano exploding and crackling, kind of like a witch's cauldron. They will have to wait for sunrise and hope for rescue. That's next on A&E. Where were you when Mount St. Helens erupted? Tell us at ANA.com. And now back to Minute by Minute. May 19, 1980, 5.55 a.m. On the morning after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, National Guard helicopter pilot Jess Hagerman takes to the sky to continue the rescue effort. I really didn't have a clue where I was. You couldn't see more than an eighth of a mile, uh, sometimes less. When the ash does part, it reveals fallen trees stretching as far as the eye can see. Despite the devastation, rescuers still hope to find survivors. But as time goes by, they find themselves placing more and more red flags to mark the dead. One family on the mountain has survived the eruption. Mike Moore, his wife Lou, and their two children have spent 26 hours in the forest near Mount St. Helens, unable to make their way to safety. Suddenly, here comes a helicopter, fly in our direction. There's a 304 squadron out of Portland. They put two paramedics on the ground. The Air Force team tries to airlift the family out. Every time the cable came down, the helicopter kicked up so much ash, nobody could see the cable. A cable rescue is impossible. The chopper will have to find a place to touch down. The Moore family and the paramedics hike to the Green River, but find no room for a landing there either. At that moment, Air National Guard chopper pilot Jess Hagerman flies over. He radios the rescue team and offers to use his smaller craft to evacuate the Moors. There was no place to set the helicopter all the way down, so I had to kind of hold it on one skid. The Moors, who had their three-month-old daughter Tara in their backpack, climb into the helicopter. They start sticking this great big huge Kelty backpack. I said, we don't have room for that. He said, well, there's a baby in there. I said, well, stuff her aboard. Hagerman takes off and brings the Moore family to nearby Longview Hospital, where they are treated for minor scratches and sent home. Hundreds of volunteers rescue more than 150 people in just 36 hours, but three are still missing and eight are confirmed dead. 31 hours after the eruption, Venus Durgan is released from the hospital. She faces two years of physical therapy to regain the use of her flayed arm. Two days after the eruption, a group of geologists lands near the observation base Coldwater One. There, they find photographer Reed Blackburn's car. We kneel down to look inside the car, and there was Reed. His hair was burned and so forth, looking in the car. Yeah. It was pretty gruesome. Three days after the eruption, President Jimmy Carter flies over the area, surveying the destruction. Federal emergency relief is on its way for the four counties hardest hit by the blast. The absolute and total devastation of a region that encompasses about 150 miles. It's the worst thing I have ever seen. The force of the eruption has spewed measurable amounts of ash as far east as Minnesota and as far south as Oklahoma. May 25, 1980. One week after the big blast, the mountain erupts again, sending a column of ash eight miles high. Compared to the May 18th eruption, it's a minor event and does minimal damage. The death toll now stands at 21, and 72 people are missing. 230 square miles have been devastated, roadways have been swept away, and railroads buried. 68... shadows of these dams, onto downstream floodplains, and potentially into the path of a devastating flood if one should fail. 
There is no such thing as a risk-free dam. All dams have some risk. The best conditioned dam, the best designed and maintained dams may have low risk, and the ones that aren't well designed and have deficiencies certainly have higher risk, but there's no such thing as a risk-free dam. More than 100,000 dams now block U.S. rivers. Most were only designed to last 50 years, and one quarter have already passed their life expectancy. After decades of neglect, the American infrastructure is in crisis. Across the country, one in 10 dams is considered a threat to human life, and more than 13% of those are considered structurally deficient or unsafe. When they fail, they can fail badly, and they can put people in harm's way. The dam problem is probably the most significant in that it gives, in many cases, people little time to react. In small towns and big cities across the country, the possibility exists that a catastrophic failure could send millions of tons of water crashing through homes. If we have complete dam failure, Berksville would no longer exist. It would be washed away. It's a serious situation that we need to plan for, and uh, you know we're, we're doing everything humanly possible to prepare. Emergency preparedness is essential for all communities living downstream of dams. And it's critical that resources be allocated to ensure that no dam, old or new, fails. The Army Corps of Engineers recently listed six of its dams as the highest priority for repairs. Making these dams safe is an expensive and time-consuming process, but the cost of not being proactive could be worse. There would likely be loss of life downstream and certainly a lot of economic damages from the flooding. We estimate two to three billion dollars in economic damages downstream if this project were to fail. Nationwide, efforts are underway to identify dams at risk. Some are being removed. But over the next ten years, more than a thousand dams will need significant repairs. Is it too late to prevent a major incident? I'm worried because every year we track the numbers in the United States, the number of unsafe and deficient dams. And we, again, we see this number going bigger and bigger and bigger, and there doesn't seem to be any um, slowing down of the increase of the number of unsafe dams. Getting older isn't the only thing that can make a dam unsafe. Most were designed before the risks of earthquakes and landslides were fully understood. An earthquake outside of Eugene, Oregon, could take out a series of dams that would send a wall of water estimated up to a billion tons. It's a late November morning sometime in the future. After days of heavy rain, the people of Eugene, Oregon are finally enjoying a sunny day. Suddenly, the ground starts to rumble, buildings shake, and people are terrified. In seconds, the shaking stops. It's an earthquake, magnitude 6.5. There's no serious damage, and everyone breathes a sigh of relief. But high in the mountains above the city, soil saturated by the rains is loosened by the quake, and landslides rush down the slopes into the reservoir of the Hills Creek Dam. Huge swaths of soil, trees, and debris flow into the rain-filled reservoir, creating waves that quickly overtop the earthen dam as the embankment gives out. Suddenly, more than 300,000 people in the valley below are in danger of being washed away. Americans have suffered the devastating consequences of a dam break before. 65 miles east of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, lies the town of Johnstown. It's situated in a valley just below the steep Allegheny Mountain Range. Here, two rivers, the Little Conemaw and Stony Creek, join together to form the Conemaw River a tributary of the Ohio River. At the end of the 19th century, Johnstown was a working-class town, feeding a booming America's insatiable appetite for steel. By 1889, there were 30,000 people sort of crammed into the valley. Just about everybody worked for the Cambria Iron Company. The whole prosperity of the valley really depended on the steel mill here in Johnstown. 14 miles upstream was the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, an exclusive retreat for the Pittsburgh elite on the banks of an artificial lake. Starting in 1879, a group of rather wealthy and influential Pittsburgh area businessmen purchased the state's old reservoir and had the vision of turning the reservoir into a gentleman's fishing and hunting resort. The grounds included the dam, which held 20 million tons of water in the man-made Lake Conemaugh. As purchasers of the property, the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club now owned and operated the dam. It was a uh, dam that had been built 
uh, almost 40 years earlier. And the original dam was well built, it hadn't been maintained. The club's agents had poorly reconstructed it and compromised all the safety features. So essentially, what you had was an accident waiting to happen. They lowered the top of the dam a few feet to build a carriage road, which certainly compromised the effectiveness of the dam. And the spillway was altered by the addition of screens that were designed to protect the club's very expensive collection of game fish. The club also, for some reason, elected not to replace the discharge pipes that were original to the structure. It was reckless. Uh, they were sort of oblivious to the consequences, and it's something of ne that you'd certainly hope that w w would never happen today. Nearly 50 years of poor decisions and neglect might never have been a problem, but in late May 1889, Johnstown experiences two days of solid rain. The lake was rising about an inch every 10 minutes. As a result, the water just kept rising, getting closer to the top of the dams, and once the water went over the top, that pretty much doomed the dam to fail. Frantic efforts are made to shore up the dam, but it's too little too late. At 3.10 p.m., the dam gives way at the center. It didn't really break, it just pushed away, and 20 million tons of water began an hour-long descent on Johnstown. By most accounts, it took about 45 minutes for the lake to disappear once the dam failed. Those who watched this happen, they were just absolutely stunned at what they were watching and horrified later to find out exactly what had happened. The torrent uproots huge trees, and in the narrow valleys, the flood reaches almost 90 feet above the river level. The small towns immediately below the dam are obliterated. Locomotives weighing 170,000 pounds are swept along for miles. By the time it reaches Johnstown, the flood is a 40-foot wall of debris. Within 10 minutes, four square miles of the town are destroyed. In its place, a churning lake 20 feet deep, topped by a crust of floating wreckage where survivors cling for their lives. On the far side of town, the rubble piles up against the stone bridge. It holds, but becomes another dam, forcing the water to rise and rush back into the city. And then the wreckage catches fire. Houses with their coal stoves burning caught the mass on fire. There were tank cars full of kerosene and oil that soaked down through the mass. That huge funeral pyre at the stone bridge burned for fully three days. 80 people who survived the initial flood were burned alive. As dawn rose the next morning, people began to make their way out of the flooded district. 2,209 men, women, and children died. 99 entire families were wiped out, including 196. men lost their wives. More than 750 victims were never a high cost environmentally and in terms of you know human suffering america didn't learn a whole lot about dams it took quite a few other tragedies to make the country more concerned about dam safety it took another 75 or 100 years uh for americans uh to start a across the country millions of people simplest terms, a dam is an impervious structure that blocks the flow of water in a river or stream, holding the water behind it. Over the centuries, dams have been built from earth, stone, masonry, wood, and concrete. Dams are an important part of our daily needs. They provide part of our daily life and infrastructure needs. They can also pose risks to those living downstream. 
dams have long been a vital part of the nation's infrastructure, contributing to industrial growth, as well as making expansion to the beckoning arid west a viable reality. Wonder, the largest electric power producing structure. A decade later, even the Hoover Dam is surpassed by the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. At 550 feet, it's taller and generates more power. But for all their grandeur, dams can also be a violent source of destruction. It's an incredible bit of hubris, really. In our we think we could take on such a force of nature as water. Well. 1,600 dams in this country that are over 100 feet tall. And there's dams that are that are that we expect loss of life. While there has been ready to build. During the 1970s, a string of high-profile dam failures cost hundreds of American lives and more than one billion dollars in damage. On February 26, 1972, a badly maintained dam holding back waste from a coal mine broke in heavy rains. On June 9, 1972, floodwaters from a heavy rainfall overtopped the Canyon Lake Dam and it quickly failed. On June 5, 1972, Modern standards failed the first time it was filled with water. Neglected Kelly Barnes Dam failed, killing thousands students and staff at the Tocoa Falls College. These initiatives were commendable, but still are from over. We serve states who have the assuring the safety of dams, and their current problem is merely growing sprawl. The communities being built beneath. Dams originally built far away from Americans living in potential danger zones. The consequences of We have dams in three categories based on the failure. means that if it fails, it's likely to cause loss of such extreme consequences. According to the 2005 update to the National Inventory of Dams, more than 10,000 dams in the U.S. are considered high hazard. We have very large dams today that sit above cities that, if they burst, would send a wall of water down and potentially drown that city. And if people can't get out of the way in the hurry, we face loss of life. As Mother Nature raises the ante, we have to. But we also have to realize there are limits to what human beings can do when we're dealing with nature. Jerry There are no two well. Came down over 20 feet high. December 2005, Jerry is the superintendent of the park with his wife Lisa and their three children. We knew that if we were going to be the f and I immediately yelled, Jerry, get the kids. I heard her scream and I sat up in bed and I got about two steps on the floor and the whole house exploded around me. The water came in, and that water it was 32 degrees at night. The family is suddenly fighting for survival.
than anything in God's response, but the loudness of the water rushing. He said, holding on to her two boys, but she or her daughter over the rushing water. Fire Chief Ben Meredith Meredith learns it's completely and their water standing in every low light spots ten foot deep water just We located the end of the tree line. Lisa and the boys are finally the third. Last person to be rescued is the tubes three year era. They found her several hundred yards of tree all curled up in a, a mat of just floating debris. The three children spend months in the hospital recovering from their injuries and hypothermia. Their physical injuries heal, but their home There was, was the
Oh yeah, I love him too.
Kasat. Along the west bank of the Mississippi River lies the city of West Wego, Louisiana. On December 22nd, 1977, the eyes of the nation were fixed on this small southern city when a 250-foot grain elevator exploded. It was heard by people over 10 miles away from the facility. The energy released in the city... Existe uma manobra que eles fazem que tem o nome de cobra, né? Na verdade, eles têm que ter outro outro risco, aquela desaceleração que tem sobre o nome de chuta cobre. E é o que ele está fazendo aqui com o Maricão, ele está vendendo, utilizando o recurso de todo o risco. Já vem para a gente que está andando em pé.
Yeah. That's why you have a 300. Amazing artifacts unearthed by accident. Not all trade scientists or adventurers like Indiana Jones. In fact, a lot of the most important archaeological discoveries are made completely by accident. Number 13, Hairpin of Catherine de' Medici. As the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559 and regent for three of her sons, Catherine was no stranger to the finer things in life. She had a large collection of jewelry, most of which has been stolen or lost. In 2012, archaeologists were excavating and preparing Fontainebleau Palace for an upcoming restoration project when they came across an incredibly interesting find. Catherine's hairpin, immediately recognizable by the intertwined seas, had been tossed into a communal toilet. A thorough, very thorough cleaning of the object revealed that it was painted in her signature colors, green and white. The mystery of the object is in where it was found. How did it end up in a communal toilet? It. As queen, she would have had her own facility, well, so what was she doing there? A more plausible explanation is not that it was lost by the queen herself, but that a lady in waiting might have stolen it and then tried to get rid of the evidence. Oh, and you are Number really 12, the Banwell Cave. In 1757, an adjacent cave filled with stalactites was found and was going to be open to the public in order to raise money for a nearby school. In an attempt to find an easier entrance, the Banwell Bone Cave was discovered by accident. The cave, when it was discovered, was covered in the bones of prehistoric animals. In fact, the pile of bones on the floor was about three feet deep. In the following years, the owner had the bones assembled along the walls, much in the fashion of the French catacombs. The man who had originally discovered the bones believed they may have been the remains of the animals who were trapped in the flood of Noah's Ark, but there's no evidence to support that. Today, the cave is open to visitors and under near constant archaeological study. Number 11, a ship found at the World Trade Center. In 2010, New York construction workers were attempting to excavate, Cheers. clear, and rebuild on the site of the World Trade Centers. During their efforts, they came across an amazing discovery. Buried beneath the soil was the remnants of a ship dating back to the antebellum period. The ship was crafted from lumber really? cut in 1773. The oaks used to build this ship were from the same area as the white oak used to construct Independence Hall, where the Constitution was signed. The ship has been identified as a Hudson River sloop and was probably buried here when it was no longer able to be used as a cargo ship. Many other artifacts were found at the site, including musket balls, French cannonballs, buttons, and more. Number 10, Mud Dragon. In an attempt to clear bedrock for a construction project, a team of Chinese construction workers nearly blew up a new species of bird-like dinosaur with dynamite. Luckily, incredibly, the dynamite merely uncovered the 72 million-year-old skeleton instead of blowing it to pieces. Although it suffered some damage, the skeleton was mostly intact and very well preserved by the mud surrounding it. The dinosaur was a large bird found encased in mud, wow. its head upright and wings outstretched as if it were still trying to get free. <coughs> it was about the size of a sheep, but belonged to a family of feathered dinosaurs, suggesting it too would have been covered in feathers Ooh, and boys. probably flightless. Ow. Number 9, King Richard III. In 2012, oh, oh. an historian named Philippa Langley was convinced she had found <coughs> the final resting place of King Richard III when she had goosebumps walking through a small parking lot. You heard right, it was a hunch. She had very little evidence, she just knew. She insisted archaeologists dig up a parking lot in the hopes that she had guessed right on the location of the Greyfriars Church in Leicester. When they broke through the pavement, they found a skeleton with scoliosis who was later DNA tested. The DNA revealed the remains were, in fact, of the long-lost king. Richard III was reburied with honor, complete with a ceremony during which a distant cousin, Benedict Cumberbatch, read a poem dedicated to his life. Number 8, Mayan Mural. 
When Luis Ramirez decided to do some renovations in his kitchen, he stumbled across something amazing. His home is at least uh, first years time old, presser, huh? and during the 18th century, it probably belonged to someone of very high status. So Since what its construction, the walls have question? been replastered again and again. So when Ramirez started chipping away the layers of plaster, he finally found the original wall of his home, and underneath three centuries of paint and plaster, he found an ancient Mayan mural. The mural depicts a procession of men in a mix of Spanish and Mayan Mayan clothing, suggesting the mural is probably depicting the Conquest Dance, which is a representation of the Spanish conquest and conversion to Christianity. Not many murals of this kind still exist, so the Ramirez find is extremely rare. Number 7. Huxon Horde Attempting to find the lost hammer of a neighboring farmer, Eric Laws was out and about wielding a metal detector. When it started beeping, he dug into the soil and didn't find his friend's hammer, but he did find a large hoard of Roman treasure. He reported it immediately, so its historical significance could be preserved, and the study began. The Huxon Horde included jewelry and coins made with enough gold and silver to be worth $4.3 million today. There were countless pieces of jewelry, including a body chain and bangle dedicated to Julianne, supposedly the jewelry's owner, as well as more than 15,000 coins dating to eight Roman emperors. The hoard was found far from any known Roman settlement, well, suggesting the family had buried it there uh, to find uh, later during the end of Roman groups. occupation in Britain. These were turbulent times and dangerous for Roman settlers, so the family was likely fleeing the country. The treasure suggests the family did come back and retrieve at least some of it, but left mm -hmm. a lot of the hoard buried. Number six, Gladiator School. It might seem odd that a gladiator school or ludus was found just outside of Vienna, but it's also important to realize that the city of Carnuntum has not been far away. Carnuntum was located on the Danube and was the capital of Upper Pannonia. Just fact, bought a 12 ton press, Roman low temp cage plates. Um, first time presser. Any tips? It is the first flower pressing. found outside of um, and would have nearly rivaled the most famous Ludus Magnus, which trained gladiators to the pre -press? Archaeologists were using a radar system to map the nearby town of Carnotum. When their machinery started showing some Do you have a pre -press and do you have micron bags? ...and a smallish gladiator ring. Archaeologists knew they'd found something incredible. They mapped the complex, which would have been about 20,000 square feet in total. Carnotum would have been home to 50,000 people at its height, and the school was dated to be 1,800 years old. Number five, Do you have parchment paper? City. Cappadocia, a region in Turkey, is dotted with immense structures called fairy chimneys. They are made of a rock soft enough to carve, and people have been carving living spaces into them for thousands of years. There are a number of known the the hell is that cities big? in Cappadocia, but the one located underneath Darren Q is among the most impressive. In 1963, a man was doing renovations on his home when he tore down a wall that led to a room connected to a long passageway. That passageway was one of thousands in the Darren Q underground city. It is incredibly elaborate with 11 stories, 15,000 air shafts, and enough room to house 20,000 people. The city features wine cellars, yeah. homes, stables, livestock pens, freshwater wells, and more. Even more impressive is the fact that they you can use a shot glass defenses, to make a pre to shut a little stone doors to steal the from the outside, and then with each level off from one another in times of invasion. And what you want to do absolutely no is you take a strip of parchment paper the mystery and behind this find run it long ways. No one knows who built it. Both ways. Four, that way it covers both sides of the shot glass cram that full in southwest france in the year 1940 what i do is i with mine i fill it all the way up to the top of the shot glass with weed then i smash that down to as tight as i can com compress it my hand and then i take my parchment paper fold it in half Stick it in between my plates. I got my press set on 165 right now. That's what I did my last pressing at. And I smash it. In 2013, construction workers in Belgrade were in for a surprise. And that was it. When, let's see. Workers unearthed an amazingly unexploded bomb that had been buried 20 feet I was done at 165 for 200 seconds. It weighed over one ton and contained 
hundred pounds of explosives. The bomb was safely executed. That's P ninety four Chem Dog and Mr. Nice. Base, where it was destroyed safely on February fifth, two thousand sixteen. Number two, Roman Villa. A man living in Wiltshire, England, was attempting to run electricity to a building in his backyard so his children could use it as a recreation room when the electricians running the cable declared they had found something. They had unearthed an elaborate mosaic tile, which turned out to be the bottom floor of an ancient Roman villa built around 175 AD. The villa was incredibly well preserved and so intricate it may have been the home of a Roman emperor. It's believed the villa was once three stories high. Among the finds here were oyster shells, suggesting they were specific. Or if you have a um, two or three inch of a Roman tube, person, which was being used as a metal pipe, you can fill that full of it. And they start packing it down inside the tube so it starts squirting out the end and it makes you pucks. Then you can just pull them apart. Smash as much as you need. Some people are up in arms over who actually made the discovery, with some crediting Yorgos Kronin <coughs> and his son Antonio. Whoever found it certainly was not looking for it. The Venus de Milo has become one of the most iconic classical works of art, probably because very little is known about her. She is this is what we use. But she very well may be a depiction of Aphrodite. She may not even be a goddess at all. This is a tube for blasting B.H.O. Someone else entirely. Her lack of arms has transformed her into a surrealist piece and left many questioning how her arms were broken off, but the rest of her remained undamaged. Which I need to find the end again. Twenty sixteen into twenty seventeen has been an insane time, with too many significant global events to mention. Many good, many terrible, and many just downright surprising. When it comes to discoveries, it's pretty much the same. Some good, some terrible, and some just downright surprising. 23 mind-blowing discoveries in the last year. Number 23, Mars Attack. Let's hope not. Curiosity rover found something a little peculiar on Mars in November of 2016. It's a golf-sized dark ball which doesn't resemble any of the rocks usually found on the planet. Using an onboard laser, the rover zapped the object, which was later confirmed to be an iron-nickel meteorite which had fallen from the Martian sky. They've named it Egg Rock. Number 22, Under the Sea. Over the past few months, quite a number of shipwrecks have been discovered. 2016 saw a 19th century cargo ship being discovered in Lake Superior. There were around 40 ships found in the Black Sea, some dating back to the Byzantine era and others from 525 BCE. These ships have also brought to light a new type of termite. Plus, an added bonus, now we know what 340-year-old cheese smells like. Aren't you glad you didn't make that discovery? Number 21, a prime example. We head to early January of 2016, where numbers made quite the newsworthy story. A large prime number was discovered, and since then, it remains unchanged and unchallenged. That number is 274-207-281. 165 doesn't give you a huge yield, but it does save your terps, and it doesn't help it taste a whole lot better. might prove more challenging. Physicists at LIGO, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and your terpenes are the existence a lot of your medicine. Waves. They confirmed this so you really you want to preserve as much the of the terpenes as you possibly can. Albert Einstein originally predicted their existence in 1916. Number 19, Long Necks, or as they're more commonly referred to, giraffes. These majestic animals roam the wild in sub-Saharan Africa. Up until just recently, it was thought that there was only one species of giraffe, but in 2016, that theory changed. New studies have proven that there are in fact four species of giraffes, and there are less than 100,000 of them living in the wild. They're down around 50,000 just in the last 30 years. Number 18, out of this world. As our technology is improving, so are our discoveries, as we have the ability to understand and analyze things that were previously near impossible. In 2016, we were able to learn there is definitely another planet hiding just behind Pluto. Scientists have called it Planet Nine, and thanks to mathematics and computers, it's believed that you're interested in getting destroyed, catch lock status. Then you want to start pressing some indica. Straight indica. Years. 
Number 17, birds of a feather. Forget and keep your birds, temperatures though, about 180 to 190. In amber, and he's been perfectly preserved for 99 million years. This discovery was made in Myanmar. Number 16, to infinity and beyond. This little piece and of And I'd press it for about. way to store data for future generations. As we protect our literature dating back centuries, so will future generations protect these storage devices. Using nanostructured glass, scientists created this storage device that can 110 seconds. And 60 terabytes of data can last in temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius and, if looked after, will last 13.8 billion years number 15 keep your eyes on the stars for Such some seem to dry bud a couple of years and this time nasa has uncovered the possibility there might be ice volcanoes on ceres ceres is a mm. planet which lies between mars and jupiter this little spot was discovered in 1801 you're gonna want to moisten your bud if it's lower than like 60 percent moisture content we all know that is the dog, and research has been done to suggest... Ideal is about 73. 11 in 16, 60 to 73 is done. right around perfect of a year for pressing. ...has proven that we've been relying on dogs for company for around 40,000 years already. One of the theories states that wolves began following humans and domesticated themselves, while another says... You can, um, wolf cubs take a tortilla Number 13. and... Put it in there with it, or you can use an orange peel, or you can use a slice of apple. Or you wouldn't tell a soul. But you don't want to leave it in there for very long. But here's the thing: it's actually not that crazy. Over in Papua New Guinea, such a fish was found. This fish is considered quite the threat to wildlife in the area and is said to be very aggressive. These fish have air-breathing organs, giving them access to both land and water. Called the climbing perch, they're thought to be heading over to Australia next, and some have even reported spotting these fish climbing trees. Number 12, the placebo effect. The placebo effect is a combination of positive thinking and tricking your brain into thinking that the fake treatment you're undergoing is the yep. real deal. New research has Orange shown peel. even people who are aware that they're taking placebo medication found that the uh, pain was still lettuce. reduced. The brain and body Piece of are celery. powerful and amazing things. Number 11. Time heals all wounds. This was quite the revelation. In a jar or in a baggie. Mean we're out of the woods. In fact, we're a long way off. But it's progress. The Antarctic ozone layer is said to be healing. Professor Susan Solomon of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. If it pounds in a turkey bag, put it in the turkey bag. Are slowly but surely working. Number ten, giant leap for mankind. Ian Burkhart has been a quadriplegic for six years, and for the first time, he was able to move his fingers. He had a small chip inserted into his brain, and using his own thoughts, he is now able to do things like swipe a credit card, play a video game, and eat his own food. Ian mm. wears a sleeve which stimulates the specific muscles he needs to use. It's given him, and will give many others, a complete nice playing rock star. new lease on life. What the fuck? Number nine, mystery solved. Lucy is a 3.2 million year old skeleton who was discovered in 1974 in Ethiopia. She's been studied extensively for death, <coughs> her death has only been confirmed in 2016. Death is <coughs> so broken, it's concluded that she fell down from around 40 feet and died when she hit the ground. Whether she was pushed or fell accidentally, that we will never know. Number eight, money saver. Thank this you. Potentially save wow, millions of I got a good single. <laughs> successfully on a drone ship I, yeah I'd, I'd leave it in there for about a day maybe a day and a half if need be on a floating drone allowing researchers to reuse the rocket no more than a week space flight has altered from costing around 60 million dollars each time to around six hundred thousand dollars according to researchers yeah obviously I'm not used to having a good signal <laughs> 2016 was a busy one for NASA and now their scientists have found an asteroid that is a constant near-earth Companion. They say there's a lot of junk circulating this asteroid, which that is thing like a giant turtle. Moon. Its real description is a quasi satellite with the name 2016 H03. They do add to not get too excited, though. Number six, not Where did they name it 2016. Strange discovery. Was supposed to hit us in 2016? Sensory meridian response, but you can just refer to it as ASMR. It's that tingling sensation you get at the back of your head or neck when you hear plastic crinkling or someone whistling. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that was great. <laughs> what size micron bags? Um oh, well we use we use a lot of ninety microns for flour and for our dry sift and bubble hash right now we're using 37s. We're going to be going down to as low as 25 and we're going to have a, the entire spectrum here pretty soon. And from what I can tell, Rosin Tech has the best bags. Now, if you're going to moisten it, I drop your temperature down to 165 and press it for 200 seconds. And if you have enough, play with the temperatures. Don't be afraid to experiment. Trying to get dad to carry it? Yeah. <laughs> After pressing, yes, sometimes I do. I'll put it directly in the fridge. That way it stops cooking. The faster you can get it to cool down, the faster you're going to preserve your turps. The better it's going to taste, the higher you, the better it's going to feel. Let's see here. 
This came from some dry sift out of the keep out of the trim bin. Show this camera, show that camera. <coughs> Cheers. Yeah, yeah. If it's fake or synthesized, it shouldn't be going in your body. <coughs> Solventless extraction is the best way to go. It's not the only way to go, but it is the best way to go. <coughs> it's the cleanest, healthiest, <coughs> a lot less dangerous. <coughs> 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 Ahem, 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 ahem
<coughs> Hell, I don't care if you're pressing for other people, too. <coughs> yes, I would recommend getting the press and 90 micron bags. If you're going to be pressing other stuff, I'd, I highly recommend getting the other bags, too. <coughs> Sometimes you get a higher yield without using a bag at all. And just as good of rosin. Excuse me, I'll be right back. Another really good thing to remember is the older the material, the darker your yield, and less your yield. Not quite all the way. You'll see as, as the longer you press that there's actually a sweet spot. Certain strains 
loves being smashed as hard as possible. Other strains and other products just like having that light squeeze. If you squeeze it too tight, it plugs up all the little micro channels inside and it doesn't let it release all the rosin. A lot of people say, smash it as hard as you possibly can. No. I'm learning that, no, that's not what you do. A lot of people think that you have to turn the temperatures way up to get the best product that, and the most out of it. No, you don't. What's up, Kelly420? Well, well, uh, ingesting and inhaling ashes and stuff like that, it can't be as good for you as everybody says. <laughs> At least I don't think. Extracting, yeah, it might be a little bit more healthy, but it might have its downfalls too. One, it does take more more uh, starting material to end up with a decent yield. Unless you're starting with the best of the best top shelf fucking bud right off off the plant. You can press Keef and have a real good yield. That'll be your highest yields. Keef, bubble hash, dry sift. No. Don't even waste your time. The keef will melt and actually get absorbed by the plant material.
wallet still in bud form. Otherwise, I'd get you some uh, micron screens and start dry sifting it. There's this thing called static sifting. And you can get the, you can actually get the dry sift screens, flat screens, from wackybags.com. You may even be able to sift it down far enough to where it's full melt. You don't even have to press it. Like 25 micron. Yes, 100% full melt. I make 100% full melt bubble hash. What do I do with the pucks afterwards? Oh, you can use them in edibles, you can use it in for um, topicals, you can use it for all kinds of different stuff. You can grind it up, decarb it. If you're gonna press it, I recommend at least a 220. Yes, wackybags.com.
And extracts has exploded here in the last five years. People have really started going go crazy about it. And now that they're figuring out you can get it solventless, it's even exploding more. I'm from Northern California. I'm up in the Emerald Triangle. Living that good life. Wackybags.com should have everything that you need. And then some. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take one more dab, and I'm going to get off of here at 1 o'clock bedtime. Thank you for stopping by and watching, asking questions. <clears throat>
Wife says so. I remember I'm on almost every day. So if you ever have any questions, don't be afraid to stop on by and hit me up. If I don't know the answer, I might be able to look it up and figure it out. experiment and figure out figure out the answer by herself. <coughs> it's the fun of having a press. You can make your own as fast as you want it. Or need it. And if you're just wanting that couch lock stuff, well, you can make that couch lock stuff. If you get good enough, you might get asked to start pressing for other people. But anyway, cheers. Bedtime, Dad. Huh. <coughs> <coughs> Well, anyway, peace out.